You know, there, there are those moments in worship that applause is called for, and I don't know about you, but it was wonderful to hear a choir loft, and, and, and Stephen knows that's my favorite anthem, and I'm just grateful for it. I'm grateful that you're here today. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6. In just a few moments, we're going to be in verse 5. Our pastor is not with us today. He is off celebrating his mother's 90th birthday. Now, if you've ever wondered, where does our pastor get all this energy? Have you ever noticed that? The man is an energizer bunny. Then you need to meet his mother. His mother is a wonderful woman, and we're grateful that he was able to be with her so you can pray for them. What a good weekend for them. You know, as I was studying for this message, I came across an account. Helmut Thielich, a noted theologian, but as a younger man, he was pastoring in Stuttgart, Germany. It was the waning days of World War II. They were surrounded by the Russians to the east. The Allies were coming to the west. There was the specter of daily bombing, not knowing when they were going to come, the, the destruction, the blood and the gore, the carnage. He was looking at the face of his people. How do you speak in the face of such need? And he chose to speak a series of messages on the Lord's Prayer. He was asked later, why did you choose that series? He took it and it was published into a book. It made its way to America. And he wrote these words. All that the preacher read in those faces and also what filled him to the brim since he was a participant is doubtless reflected in these sermons. And the Lord's Prayer was able to contain it all. There was not a single question that we could not have brought to it and not one that would not have been transformed if we put it in the form of a prayer. You know, that statement struck me. The Lord's Prayer was able to contain it all. Well, across these weeks, we've been in the Lord's Prayer. Our pastor has taken us through a series that he's called Patterns of Prayer. And we've taken this prayer that Jesus offered for us And we've sought to understand what the deeper meaning is for our lives. We've been challenged to to memorize this, to say it three times a day. And we come today at the end of this series, and and we remember that as we've gone through this prayer, prayer, we've reminded ourselves that God is our Father, that as followers of Jesus Christ, that we are in relationship with Him. Think about that. Do you have a relationship with your Father? Abba. We spoke that God's name is hallowed, that he's holy, and that we are called to live holy lives, set apart for his glory, and in so doing that we seek his kingdom, and we pray that his will might be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what does that mean to us? It means that his priorities become our priorities, that we take on his agenda. As we were praying for Ukraine, and I was was listening to Megan as she led us in prayer, that God's priorities become our priorities as we deal with life. We become kingdom people. We submit ourselves to him. We spoke about our daily dependence upon him for our needs. Give us this day our daily bread, our daily provision, and so doing, We have the opportunity then to enter into his kingdom purposes and also practice generosity to share what we have. And we do so to his glory. And God continues to meet needs. We spent time talking about what it means to be a people of grace, to have our sins forgiven. That's how we enter into relationship with God. That's how he becomes our father. He initiated it through our Lord Jesus Christ And in so doing, we are called to be grace givers. We ask him to forgive our debts as what? We have forgiven those that we have debts against. God calls us to be people of grace. And you know what I've discovered over the years is oftentimes we fail to understand that we are called to extend grace. To extend forgiveness is one of the values of this church that Together, we extend grace to one another. And in so doing it, we extend it to the world. And yet so often, we harbor petty jealousies and angers, slights, maybe some major life-changing and some that are small. 
and we hold them in and we build around ourselves this wall. And in so doing, we close ourselves to the grace that we seek from our Lord. We spoke two weeks ago about the reality of evil and the fact that temptation comes into our lives and we ask God to deliver us from evil. Temptation. And so today we come as we conclude this series and we we continue to look at what prayer means to us and we ask a very simple question. What do I say to God in prayer? And my friends, as I've thought about this question this week, I've thought the Lord's Prayer contains it all. So today we're going to be looking at some commentary Jesus gives in the book of Matthew to the Lord's Prayer that is the intro to it. So if you've got your Bibles, again, look with me. Matthew chapter 6, and I'll begin reading in verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen, and then your Father who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. So today as we consider what is it that we say to God in prayer, if you're taking notes, I do hope that you have a pen or a pencil. There should be some pencils and Purex. I'm going to give you lots of scripture today, some things that you could go back and look at. But my first point today is, why should I pray? As I consider what to pray, well, why, why should I pray? And Jesus answered that in verse 7. He talks about, and when you pray. He said the same thing in verse 5. It's assumed. And when you pray, not if you pray. And then he contrasts the prayer of the follower of Jesus, the believer, to the prayer of the pagans. He said, don't be like the pagans, for they think they can be heard because of their many words. And again, he contrasts the prayer. He uses this word babbling. Well, babbling would mean then what it means now. I can remember when my girls were very little and I'd come home at the end of the day, it would be, daddy, 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 daddy. Anybody remember those days? And so you'd finally, you'd look down and say, honey, what is it you need? I don't know. (laughs) It was just this volume of words that were flowing out. And that's the idea that Jesus is accounting for here because it was the practice of the pagans. If you look in 1 Kings chapter 18, you'll see a great illustration of this. 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah is on Mount Carmel. He is with the prophets of Baal. And they have offered a sacrifice He'll offer a sacrifice later. And so as the, as the prophets of Baal offer their sacrifice, they call upon Baal to prove that he is. And they call upon him to send the fire from heaven. And so they begin to speak. Baal, answer us. Baal, answer us. Baal, answer us. All across the morning, into the noon, and into the afternoon, their voices are hoarse. Baal, answer us. And there is no answer. Look with me in verse 36. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me so that these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Look in verse 38. Then the fire fell The fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil. And Elijah had even gone the extra mile. He had just doused everything with water, and it licked up the water of the trench. My friends, prayer isn't babbling. It's not this volume of words as they were trying to do. Baal, answer us. Baal, answer us. It's not that. It is coming to God with our hearts with our needs. That's what we've learned all across this series, that prayer is intimate, right? Prayer is to be relational. We are speaking to our Father. We're speaking to our Father. You know, several months ago, it was the end of the day, and I received a FaceTime. So I opened it up. It's my daughter, Emma, and there is my little four-year-old grandson, William. And William looks at me and says, Papa, come play with me. 
Papa, come play with me. I said, William, I don't have time for you. I've got, I've got the Lord's work to be done. I've got important things to do. William, I, I can't do this, right? Is that what I said? I said, William, Papa is on his way. Papa's on his way. That boy and his sister have me wrapped. Papa, come play with me. And that is the picture that I have here of the intimacy of our prayer. God is there. He doesn't hang up. He doesn't ignore. He hears the prayers of his people. He hears our hearts. But gang, let me just remind you, prayer is not about impressing God. Again, it's not about the sheer volume of words that you use. It's not about the language, how flowery or flowing that it is. It's about a heart that is devoted to him. It's not about manipulating God to your own means. It's not about bargaining with God. You know, sometimes you'll see on a sitcom a character who is trying to make a point. He says, oh, God, if you'll let me do this, and he kind of gets that smug grin on his face, I'll do that. It's kind of like if I said, oh, God, if you'll let me win the lottery, I'll tithe. That'll get his attention, right? Well, I don't play the lottery. And if I did, God wouldn't let me win. He couldn't trust me with the money. But now if you do and you do win, I want to say on behalf of Park City's Baptist Church, we will accept your tithe. We'll use it to God's great glory. We'll resource some things. But prayer's not about bargaining with God. Prayer's about coming to God. Coming to him with your heart. What should I say to God? Well, again, you ask, how should I pray? How should I pray? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul is speaking to the church at Thessalonica, and he talks about the marks of a New Testament church. And there's a verse here. It's very short. Verse 17 in the NIV says, pray continually. Pray continually. Now, if you learned it in the King James Version or even the ESV renders it this way, it's pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Now, in this passage, he talks about a church should be marked by joy. Now, I don't know about you, I love Sunday mornings. I had someone not long ago say, oh, you must hate Sundays. I love Sundays. I love the hallways. I love it when the sanctuary is full. It's time to be back I love it when I'm in the hallways and you see people you haven't seen for a while. I love the people of God. Joy. But he says the church ought to be marked by prayer and by thanksgiving. So when we talk about pray without ceasing, to pray continually, he's talking to you. And he's saying as a church, if we want to honor the pastor's request that we are a center of prayer, it's not about him just praying. It's not about Megan or the staff coming together and praying. It's not about the fellowship of deacons who do pray. That's a small slice of Park Cities. It's about all of us that we pray. We pray. We pray for what God is doing, what we hope that God will do. But you know what I've discovered over the years? A lot of times, it's more fun to complain. Isn't it, though? Especially if you can find somebody that will agree with you. You know, there's not a one of us in this room today, there's not a person online today that doesn't want the ministries of this church to flourish, that doesn't want us to truly be a great commission church, a church of transformative presence here right at 3933 Northwest Parkway for the University Park, for North Dallas, but for the broader world. There's not a one of us in here that doesn't want that. But do we pray that? There's not a one of us right now that's not concerned about the world situation. Well, let me ask you this. Are you praying for Vladimir Putin? I am, it's hard, but I'm praying for him. Are you praying for your government leaders? It's easy to complain. It's easy to pound the pulpit, the desk. But the reality is prayer. Do you bring your requests for your family for your broader church family, for the world, to the Lord. Pray without ceasing. That's how you should pray. So when I ask the question, why should I pray? Jesus says, it's a given. When you pray. When you pray. But my friends, remember this. It's a privilege to pray. It's a privilege to pray. Secondly, Okay, when should I pray then? Well, in verse 8, Jesus says this, 
For your father knows what you need before you ask him. That's an interesting, interesting thought. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. So when should I pray? I should be continually praying. Bringing our requests before the Lord. The Pew Research Center, back in the past year, released a study on the state of prayer in America. And it found that Americans of all stripes, whether they were people of faith, or of a different faith tradition, or of no faith, that 55% of Americans said that prayer was actually an important part of their life. Now, if you pulled out of that the identifying Christians, Christians, the percentage went up. You would expect so. It went up to 63%. And the Christians said that their prayer life meant a lot to them, especially as they encountered life's decisions. Now, what was interesting is you read down into the report, the higher people went up the socioeconomic ladder, the less inclined they were to pray. But that's a sermon for another day that we'll let the pastor preach right there. (laughs) But what we see is Americans value prayer. Well, why? Well, one of the reasons is God values prayer. That's what we've seen in the Lord's Prayer. God values our prayer, our, our coming to him as our father. Now, in the Gospel of Luke, he also records the Lord's Prayer. Now, it's in a different context. It's, it's in the context of the disciples coming and saying, we want you to teach us to pray the way John taught his disciples. Teach us to pray. And so Jesus gives the Lord's Prayer. At the conclusion, he goes into a parable. And then if you were ever a child in a Baptist church that did Bible drill, you had this verse. Verse 10, for everyone who asks, receives. For everyone, uh, and to him who knocks, the door will be open. He who seeks, finds. And then Jesus says this, Which of your fathers, if your son asked for a snake, would give him a, a, a fish, would give him a snake instead? Now, what he's doing there, he's referring to a, to a creature that was in the Sea of Galilee that, that was like a fish, but it was also like a snake, but it didn't have scales. And so it was unclean to eat, and no father... No Jewish father would give his child that to eat when they couldn't eat it. That'd be cruel. He goes on to say, or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? You know, one of the things we receive as we pray is just more of him. As we seek the Lord in prayer, as we seek his kingdom, that his will might be done, Jesus tells us it's not presumptuous, it's not overconfidence. He says it, we receive more of him. We can come to him in confidence and bring our requests before him. We can ask, we can seek, we can knock, and we can understand that God hears our prayers We can be confident in that. And yet, there are those times when we have no answer. Now, I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I would imagine all of us have prayed in the past, and yet the answer that we were seeking is not the answer that we received. What do you do with that? Well, here's an example. In Mark chapter 14, we see Jesus Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's been in the upper room with the disciples. They've celebrated the Passover together. He's given the meaning of the Lord's Supper to us, those that follow. He has seen Judas depart, and he and the disciples have made their way out, and they made their way to this garden, this place of prayer. He goes off by himself, and he prays in verse 36 these words, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. I want you to think about that. Think about the tenderness of the son praying to the father. Abba, Father, I know all things are possible for you. Now, here's his request. Take this cup from me. We know he's referring to the cross. Take this cup from me. But listen, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus, part of the triune Godhead. 
Jesus in Colossians, it says that he created all and in him all things are held together. Jesus willingly submitted his will to the will of the Father. Isaiah 55 or 53 verse 5 says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed. It was the will of the Father for Jesus to take that walk to the cross, to submit himself to the cross, to humble himself as Paul says in Philippians chapter two, to take on death, to take on our sin, our chastisement that brings us peace so that we might enter into relationship with whom? Our Father. Our Father. That was the will of God. And Jesus submitted himself. Now another New Testament example is the Apostle Paul. Paul writing to the church of Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, he, he essentially is giving a testimony about what he calls a thorn in the flesh. Now, he doesn't identify the thorn, but it's assumed as a physical disability, maybe as eyesight. We don't know exactly, but he says here, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Think about that. That's not just the dinner hour prayer when you're ready to jump into your food and saying, hey, God, please heal. That's not what he's referring to. It wasn't a flippant request. The intensity here is that he entered into seasons of prayer. He spoke to God about this need. God, would you relieve me of this physical distress? And God said no. God said no. How did Paul handle it? How did Paul handle it? He goes on to say this, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that God's power might rest on me. We pray, thy will be done. Thy will be done on earth. Okay, what is earth? Our lives. We seek him. And again, Jesus tells us as we seek him, we receive more of him. We receive more of him. Number three, what to pray when I don't know what to pray. If you've been in that position, you know you ought to pray, but you don't know what to pray. Back 39 years ago this week, One of the dearest friends that I ever had, she and her husband, he was my pastor. They had discipled me. I loved them. And she was going to be giving birth to their first child. And she and the child died during childbirth. I was at the hospital. It was devastating. As he began to process this life that he had never planned, that he had never hoped for, someone gave him a quote. It's one you may have heard from Charles Spurgeon. God is too good to be unkind. He's too wise to be mistaken. And when you can't trace his hand, we must trust his heart. Have you ever been in those situations in life where you honestly cannot trace the hand of God? You don't see it. I can remember years ago walking out on a pier. It was dark. It was cold. And I said, God, I I don't know what to do. When you can't trace the hand of God, my friends, you can always trust the heart of God. Where do you see the heart of God? You see it in Scripture. When you don't know what to pray, pray Scripture. There's not an emotion that you can feel that is not recorded in Scripture. Look to the prayers within the Psalms. Look to the prayers within the Psalms. We read one this morning in this service. Pray scripture. I can remember as a new believer not knowing exactly what I was to do and how I should respond, and it was a difficult time. And I can remember Psalm 27 became a great friend of mine. Every night I would read this. I would work to memorize it. Psalm 27, the Lord is my stronghold. Of of whom shall I be afraid? There are those seasons in life that are seasons of fear and tension. We prayed for Ukraine today. The world situation is one that has us all concerned. 
Psalm 46.1, God is our refuge. God is our strength. He's a very present help in trouble. Pray that. Circle that in your Bibles if you're at finding yourself in that condition today. If you're like me and after two years of COVID, you are tired. You're weary. First Peter 5.7 says, cast all your cares on him because he what? He cares for you. There's a promise of God. Circle it and pray it. When you don't know what to pray, pray the word of God. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary. If you're burdened, and I'll give you rest. You may find yourself in a position of such great joy, you don't know how to express it. Guess what? Read the Psalms. You'll find some prayers there. Look at Psalm 100. Shout to the Lord. Shout to the Lord. Wouldn't hurt us to do a little bit of shouting. Shout in joy. The church is supposed to be a place of joy. Share your heart with God. Look to the Psalms of Ascents that you'll find in the Psalms. You're going to find Psalms as people are walking up to the Temple Mount that were Psalms of great joy. You'll also find Psalms of repentance. If you find yourself tempted, James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8 talks about how you submit yourself to God. And what does he say? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. There's a prayer right there. If you found yourself worried and anxious over COVID, what it's doing to you, your family, the world, some of you may have lost someone, someone that you know, someone that you love. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with grief? Well, if you're dealing with anxiety... Philippians chapter 4, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, in prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And what's the promise of God? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If you're struggling with guilt, if there's sin in your life and you don't know how to come to God, go to Psalm 51. See how David pours out the horror of what he's committed to the Lord himself. 1 John 1, 9, circle it in your Bible. He is faithful and just to forgive. When I don't know how to pray, you pray scripture. You pray scripture. If you say, well, Rodney, I don't know all those scriptures, then here's an easy way to do it. Google it. That's right. Just go in and do a search for promises of the Bible. You're going to find the promises of God. Go to your concordance. Talk to someone. Help them help you. But you go to God in prayer. When you don't know how to pray, pray. And again, I want to remind you the benefit is you receive more of God himself. What about when I don't want to pray? Pray. Pray. John Bunyan wrote these words. Prayer is a sincere, sensible, affectionate pouring out of the soul to God through Christ in the strength and assistance of the Spirit for such things as God has promised us. I love that expression, a sincere, sensible, affectionate to our Father and pouring out our soul. What have we learned this morning? God knows my heart. God knows my heart better than I do. He knows my need more intimately than I do. Go to your Father. So as we conclude this series on patterns of prayer, last week in here, our pastor issued a challenge. It's the 10-minute challenge. If you were not here, let me share with you what it was. And that is, if you don't have a regular pattern of prayer, it's time to start one. And the challenge was, every day between now and Easter, put aside 10 minutes and pray. Best time to do it is probably going to be in the morning when you get up. That way you do it. I can remember Dr. Dennison years ago said, put it on your calendar. Put the name God on your calendar. You're probably not going to skip that appointment right there. Okay. So you pray. Now, 10 minutes in a day doesn't seem like very long until all of a sudden you're confronted with what do I say? I want to give you a very simple model of prayer. It's the ACTS model. The A stands for adoration. You come to God and you extol him for his character, who he is, and you thank God. 
You declare his great worth. You adore him. C is for confession. Confession. Now, I want you to notice how the Acts model of prayer actually follows the Lord's Prayer. Confession. We come to him. We confess our sins. We speak to him about it. And what may happen is God might have you go speak to someone else. But you bring your sins to God. You confess them to him. The T is thanksgiving. How often do you pray for something and then never acknowledge before God all that he's done for you? You thank him. You thank him. I I shared in this room probably two years ago now, three years ago now, that every night before I fall asleep, my pattern is I go through my top 10 items of gratitude across the day. Sometimes it could be a top 100 The day little William called me, that was in my top 10 right there. There are some days when it's a little more difficult. And I'll find myself thanking God for the beating of my heart. That my daily needs were met. But you practice active gratitude. You thank him. And then S is supplication. Supplication. That's when you bring your needs before him. Generally... We put it reverse. We jump into prayer and go into exactly what we're wanting from God. This puts our supplication in the right order. You bring the needs of the day before your Lord. You bring the concerns that you have for your family before the Lord, your friends, your work. You pray for your church. Again, the assumption is we are a praying church. We pray when we all pray. You pray for the world situation. You pray for government and leadership. You bring them first to God and you pray. So take that challenge between now and Easter, 10 minutes every day. The way I want us to close the service today is I want us to pray. We're going to take a few moments and just in the quiet of this moment, I want you to come to your Father. I want you to pray. Just as he leads, again, you could use the Acts model But pray, seek him. Take an opportunity before you go out into the rest of the day to be quiet before him. And then I'm going to come back up and together we're going to say the Lord's Prayer. If you know it by heart, and I hope you do, you'll keep your eyes closed. And if not, we'll have it on the screen for you. So right now, would you all bow your heads in prayer? And again, I'll come up in just a few moments and we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.